The Olkinas family lived near the train station in the village of Panamuneles. Noachas Olkinas was the local pharmacist. He was well known to the community for his kindness, often administering medicine to the sick free of charge. Mr. Olkinas would say to his customers, only pay me if my medicine helps you get better. He was an intellectual who read Pushkin, Lermontov, and Dostoevsky. Although Noachas Olkinas was Jewish and Litvak, he was a close friend of the Catholic parish priest, Josephus Matelionis. They drank tea together in the rectory every Sunday afternoon after Mass. Both practiced religious tolerance and taught it to others. In the 1930s, as a gesture of friendship to Father Matelonis and as a symbol of respect for the Catholic Church, Noachas Olkinas donated an ornately carved oak confessional to the Panamoneles Church. The confessional is still used today and is located close to the entrance of the church. Asna and Noachas Olkinas had four children, Ilya, born in 1919, Matilda, born in 1922, Mika, born in 1925, and Grune, born in 1930. Matilda was well known in the Rokishkis area as a gifted poet. Her poems have been published in literary journals since she was 13. She was often invited to recite her poems at literary evenings in Rokishkis, and then later in Vilnius when she studied French and Russian literature at Vilnius University in 1940-1941. That was the last year of her life. Matilda's friends recalled that Matilda was warm, sincere, but at the same time reserved. During breaks between classes, she would walk the corridors deep in thought. She would pause and gaze out the window. When her friends saw her like this, they would say, shush, be quiet. Matilda is composing poetry. In the summer of 2018, I spent an afternoon with 93-year-old Lucia Nenishkite Vizgirdiana in the Vilnius neighborhood of Zveninas. Lucia's grandparents lived across the yard from the Olkinas family and operated a mill. As a child, Lucia became the best friend of Mika and Matilda. She would spend her summer holidays and her Christmas holidays with the Olkinas family. Lucia recalled that every day the neighborhood children would eat lunch at the Olkinas home and dinner at her grandparents' house. Her grandparents would tease that Asna Olkinas fed Lucia so well that she had no appetite left for dinner. Her grandmother would bring Asna Olkinas cheese and butter. Every summer, her grandmother would order a bolt of fabric and sew identical dresses for the three Olkinas girls and for Lucia. On Saturdays, both the Jewish family and their Lithuanian friends and neighbors observed the Sabbath together. At Sabbath dinner, the children would read, put on plays, and entertain the guests. Matilda's early poems were full of exuberance and love of nature, like her poem, La Vazaritas, or Good Morning. Good morning! Oh, the sun has woken and leaps from her bed. She opens one eye, another, good morning. And all the flowers rejoice, all the flowers and the birds. They call out one after the other, good morning. And into the grand dewy meadow, the girl sends the herd. And the flowers greet her and the sun and the birds. And everywhere, it's just the sun. The sun riding her chariot across the sky. The sun diving into the brook. The sun in every blossom. The sun in every cup, in every drop of dew. But the sun shines most in the eyes of the little girl. Her eyes are bright, full of light. They greet her joyful world. Burst into life, filled with sunshine. Good morning, good morning. Lucia told us Matilda's father encouraged creativity and self-expression in his children. I'm not sure whether he was serious or half joking, Lucia recalled. 
But Mr. Olkinas would say to Matilda, I want to read a new poem written by you every Sabbath. Matilda would sit up in the attic and compose her poems. Mika came up with a plan. Let's be Matilda's muses, she said. We dressed up in long dresses and wrapped ourselves in shawls. We climbed up into the attic and twirled around Matilda, calling out, We are your muses! We are your muses! We're here to inspire your poetry. Oh, I remember that so well. August 17, 1940. From Matilda Olkenaita's diary. I like to sit in my cozy room and write after a long day, late in the evening. In the evenings, Papa always says to me, one more day has passed. His comment is directed at me. One more day has passed and I haven't accomplished anything. I must admit, I enjoy arguing with Papa. Our arguments are cultured and rarely escalate beyond the norms of civility. Papa is worried about my future. But I just hold on to a few simple cliches to make my point. Papa is deeply hurt that I'm not writing now. I always just find some rationalization which I don't believe and nobody else does either. One more day has passed. Much was felt, but nothing was said. Matilda and her sister Mika, Lucia remembers, were creative, brilliant, expressive, vocal. Lucia said that Mr. Olkin would introduce games to teach his children creativity, like naming roads that had not been named in the village with interesting names. When Matilda started studying in the gymnasium, she decided that they were too old to play children's games. She suggested they start a newspaper, and they did. Every Sabbath, the guests could read the handwritten newspaper for the price of 20 cents. The girls would take their earnings to the local shop to buy carutas, caramel candies. Many of Matilda's poems from this early peaceful period before World War II reflect a quiet, introspective life, one shared with community. August 17. 1940, from Matilda's Diary. I hear a cricket singing. He took up residence with us tonight. They say that crickets bring good luck. So there, good fortune has come to live with us. To work and to create and to love and to be loved. An idle evening. Evening comes and howls under your window, calling longing in a creaking voice. What to expect you no longer know, when under the window sits blue longing's poise. Evening comes carrying the ancient moon, and a crackling star glistens beyond the window. Somewhere behind the stove is the cricket's abode, and under the floor lives a small, quick mouse. Longing comes carrying an old violin and plays a serenade under the window. How could you ever ask him to leave when he is so sad and so polite? And you feel hopelessly sorry for yourself when longing plays its song on the windowsill and it all seems so ridiculous to you, the mouse, the moon, the cricket. And it seems to you that you've gone mad and even turned to poetry when gazing at the moon, you sigh hopelessly. Lucia pulled out a small leather bound album from the 1930s and showed it to us. Such books are called atmintis or memory books. Before the war, most people kept diaries in which they recorded their private thoughts and reflections on life. But they also kept a second book, a book that was passed around to friends in which they wrote poems, drew pictures, expressed their love for the owner of the book. Lucia showed us artwork by Ilya, by Mika, and then read us an amusing poem written by Matilda when she was just 14. 
The poem describes hayrides and other country entertainment experienced together with Lucia on her summer holiday. When she finished reading, Lucia pressed the book to her chest and said, Matilda and Mika were my muses. They were poets. They were incredibly kind and gentle girls. Never once did we argue. Never once did an unkind word pass their lips. When I lost them, I lost everything. The last time Lucia saw Matilda alive was when she went to visit her in the room she rented across the street from the synagogue on Pilema Street in Vilnius. Matilda told Lucia that she had dedicated a poem to her and that she should look for it in a certain magazine. Lucia recited the poem to us from memory. It was written the day Lucia's family home and mill in Badamoneres were privatized by the Soviets and the family was forced to leave. Your tiny room was white, filled with sunlight, and your shutters were white too. You dried mint on your windowsill. Every spring you picked violets and kept them in water on your table. And every night you wound your ancient clock. Tell me why that night the wind blew out your candle. Who rapped on your window, paused a moment, then left? It was your fate calling, knocking quietly on your white shutters. It stopped your clock. It snuffed out your white candle. Your tiny room was white and sunny, but the world is so wide. Where will you go, beloved? Matilda showed Lucia a pair of beautiful, expensive Czech shoes. She smiled and said, my love gave me these. Lucia asked if Sheraz, the son of the Rokishkis pharmacist, gave her the shoes. Oh no, my true love, Matilda answered mysteriously. Lucia remembers Matilda was very happy that day. She was content with her life. That is how she likes to remember her. A few weeks later, the Nazis occupied Lithuania and Matilda's young life of love and poetry was cut short. My people. A pair of dark eyes ignite once again with a pain that cannot be extinguished. And they, they just keep walking past and away. But for me, Lord, there are no words. Do you hear? Do you hear that awful laughter? The hills, even the hills shake with the sound and the rivers will faint, and the seas will faint, and the stone will cry, the stone will cry. You are laughing. You walk past and keep on walking, but for me, Lord, there are no words for my horror. That laughter, that awful laughter, and dark eyes flash with an undying, relentless, pain. As early as 1938, Matilda began writing about her premonitions that a terrible fate will befall the Jewish people. In March 1940, she wrote this poem in her notebook, A Jewish Lullaby. My tiny little baby, why won't you fall asleep? Longing overwhelms you tonight. Longing crouches beside your cradle. The nights are long and dark, and the road leads far into the distance. On such a night you will leave me, my tiny little baby. And suffering will wait for you, like a beloved friend beside the gate. Great suffering and hardship will carry you silently through long generations. Long generations carry suffering from the cradle to the grave, suffering immense and deep and as endless as the night. 
fall asleep now. It is a long road that will lead you into the night. Go to sleep. I will sing to you, my tiny little baby. Sometimes in her diary, Matilda confused her premonitions with anxieties over the young man she elusively referred to as her love, or simply him, written with a capital H. August 15, 1940, from Matilda's diary. It's been a strange summer this year. Every goodbye is painful. And it seems as though everything is passing and will soon be gone forever. When I parted with my love, I felt as though I'll never see him again. I walked home from the station late at night. The moon was full and so bright that you could read a book by its light. A long shadow trailed after me as I walked. And it seemed as though this were the last night of summer bright and humid and restless to the point of tears. Often, he does not even see me, and he doesn't understand me. I asked him to write something for me. He took that as my whim and wouldn't write anything. But I so wanted to have a few words that I could take away from this evening, which felt as though it were our last together. I wanted to read him a poem in French today, but already by the second line, I sensed that he was not listening. So I stopped reading. After such moments, when he becomes serious and asks me if I would agree to leave everything behind and run away with him, the sound of his words are painful to me. And I feel as though he were mocking me. It's no good. It can't be that love will always be like this for me. Before, I always thought, or perhaps I was just trying to convince myself that my feelings will always match his, which were unknown to me then. He is not keeping a diary now. He sleeps soundly. I wish him well. Matilda's young man, her diary reveals, showed her affection and then later withheld it. After a final breakup, Matilda impetuously penned a poem between diary entries that equates his betrayal with her relentless premonitions of coming disaster and her own death. Eight months before her death, Matilda wrote this poem that describes her own funeral. Her handwriting is rushed, messy, as though she wrote the poem hastily, spontaneously, expressing the emotions that were weighing on her. Was this a premonition? Or was she frightened by the war that was drawing closer and closer to Lithuania? Oh, how many have gathered in my home of mourning. I hold an infant in my arms, and my infant is death. They brought a silver sash and armfuls of lilies white, and I cannot thank them. I cannot smile. All around me are lilies white, white, and faces wearing bright smiles. But my hands are so cold, a black ribbon is tied in my hair. Someone has trampled my love, the whitest of the white blossoms. And among the wilted lilies, I see them, I speak to them. Oh, how many have gathered, and no one will see love. I hold an infant in my arms, and my infant is dead. Many of Matilda's poems express a premonition of death, but on the pages of her diary, Matilda would often ponder the meaning of life. September 11, 1940, Matilda's Diary. I'm thinking now about what a person's natural state of being is. Whether it is to live a simple, gray, everyday life where we approach things with a light and open touch, or whether it is to live in an enlightened state of being, where between us and phenomenon a deeper feeling arises that raises the level of our thoughts, which gives everything meaning, placing it all on a higher plane. Is a person's nature gray and mundane and only very rarely does it rise into a higher spiritual plane, 
Or is it full of light, call it sacred, and only by force pushed down into the level of this gray everyday existence? And where is the true me? Is it the me who gossips about others, chatters away, gets angry and has little patience? Or is it the me who rises above and creates, who loves, who trembles in eternal bliss when the evening spreads across the wide fields and the heavens overhead are wide open and endless and when in this sacred silence you hear the word of God speaking to you? What is the natural state of a human being? Perhaps both are natural to us, just like hate and love, like destruction and creativity, like keeping watch and sleeping. In her diary, Matilda wrote about her family, their shared moments of warmth, but also their squabbles. Despite the Soviet occupation, Matilda hoped to one day publish a collection of her poems on September 1st, 1940, Matilda noted, Today it is exactly one year since the war began. The newspapers have marked the occasion by writing their headlines all in capital letters. It's horrific when you think about it, but I'm not taking it to heart. She continues to write in that same diary entry, The day that I must leave is drawing close. This year, I will need to study hard and put all my energy into my work. I am considering studying Slavic languages as an elective, but I will give it some more thought. Maybe. Whatever I end up choosing, I would like to work very seriously at my studies this year. I'd like to improve my grade in the Lithuanian language. I will also need to take a few exams, and then, and then, I wish to publish my book I want to resolve my relationship with him. If I see that we do not have that thing that is called Wahlverwandtschaft, then I will sacrifice everything and step aside. A few days later, on September 4th, 1940, Matilda expressed doubt about her collection of poems. She observed that her poems were not consistent with the dominating Soviet ideology of those times and feared that her poems would not be published. Today I shouldn't write in my diary. It has been a day without sadness and without joy. I read a book in three hours. I walked around in my bathroom all day long. My throat hurt. The battery in my radio died. What I should do is sit down and work on editing several poems. Oh, that poetry collection of mine. I am working on it with no inspiration, knowing that no one will publish it anyway. There is nothing in my poems that is relevant. I write about the pain of suffering over centuries at a time when we are required to be writing and singing about how happy we are today and about our bright tomorrow. At a time when one of Lithuania's most beloved poets, Salomea, that is, had succumbed under the weight of the first Soviet occupation and began writing odes to Stalin, Matilda was true to her poetic vision. Even knowing that it was unlikely that her collection of poems would be published because she refused to change her artistic vision to suit the politics of the times, she continued writing in her own voice never compromising her artistic or moral integrity. In a diary entry dated August 29, 1940, Matilda criticizes the Lithuanian poets who wrote socialist realist verses honoring Stalin. Times are awful. The world has spilled out into the streets. People shove a red handkerchief into their pocket and shout, Salomea, that is, I cannot fathom how normal people can write that way. There are banners and more banners everywhere. The biggest communist, if there were such a one who was a cultured person, would not be able to stand it. I often think about how people lack culture. It's sad. Could it even be possible for communism and its ideology 
to be expressed in poems that are not dominated by destruction, but by creativity, not by hatred, but by love. Matilda writes about how she disliked the Soviet regime because they felt she felt they were common and because they liked to control artists. Yet her brother Ilya joined the communist youth, quite possibly out of idealism. Matilda wrote in her diary with irony, We received a letter from Ilya. It was a patriotic letter about our Soviet homeland. Ilya is one of those enlightened people who believes in communism. As 1940, the year of the Soviet occupation progresses, the wish to lead an ordinary life becomes a pervasive theme in Matilda's diary. November 20th, 1940, from Matilda's diary. If only I had a baby to care for, I would calm down. And not because I would beat down all my passion, but because I would have someone to give all my fire all my love, all my life. I would like a healthy, beautiful baby, one with brown eyes or blue eyes like his. A healthy, beautiful baby. That would be my compensation for my difficult, heavy days, for all my days of longing, all my restless nights. Matilda's sense of impending doom continues. On August 31st, she wrote in her diary, I went to a dance this evening. I danced and danced as though I wanted to dance all the pain in my soul away. By the fall of 1940, Lithuania had been incorporated into the Soviet Union, which was an ally of Nazi Germany at the time. However, the incongruity of their alliance was apparent to all, and fears of the war reaching Lithuania grew. Matilda's poems became more preoccupied with the impending doom that she sensed was coming to her country and to the Jewish people. She longs to utter one single word that could bring the world back to its senses. A word. It is so difficult for me. I'd like to utter just one word. That unspoken word trembles within me. I see processions, generations gliding past, and a blue longing and shivering, suffering, and joy quivering in tiny rays of light, and the pain of an eon of shattered hopes. But I am that unspoken word in shadow. I carry that unspoken word in my heart. It is so difficult for me. I'd like to utter that one word, just one word for the crowds and for the nations. The processions would pause. Time would come to a halt. All the generations would stop and listen. And my word would flutter above the mountains and the seas, above flowing rivers and rough waters, and longing and trembling suffering would cease, and the pain of an eon of shattered hopes. In a poem written June 27, 1940, Matilda envisions death as the grim reaper, who according to Lithuanian folklore, takes on human form and comes to collect his due. All the skiffs have foundered, and mine will sink as well. Death is waiting through troubled waters. And death bade me sing my final hymn. And death bade me dance my final dance. And so I sing my hymn to the seagulls and to the swells. The azure heavens listen, and I sing to them too. And the sea carries my skiff through a window, carries me away to sleep, and will put me under. Tonight, death wanders through restless waters. The sun has sunk already, and my skiff 
will sink as well. Matilda knew that World War II would impact her generation very directly. In a poem written October 11, 1939, entitled simply, For My Dear Idealist, Matilda expresses the fears that every young woman faced knowing the man she loved would be called to war. For my dear idealist, the sun has drowned in the sea, and you, what awaits you? The world's road is bloody, without love, without heart. The sun has drowned in the sea, and the night will be dark. Oh, but your eyes are brilliant and full of love, full of heart. The sun has drowned in the sea, beyond blue hills. Will you return our sun? Will you bring her back? The world's path is bloody, without love, without heart. Perhaps your brilliant eyes will lead us to the sun. In a poem dated October 19, 1938, Matilda describes a vision that the sun, her symbol of hope and joy and life, is carried off beyond three hills by a black angel. Below the poem, she scribbled a note, written during the Gnosiology lesson. I could only imagine that Matilda quickly penned this poem during a lecture, moved by intuition, or perhaps by the content of the lecture. I did not know what gnosiology is, so I looked it up. Gnosiology is the study of knowledge. It is a term of 18th century aesthetics, meaning the philosophy of knowledge. Beyond three hills, the sun went down. It was dusk when we set out. A black angel carried off the sun. Beyond three hills, the sun has set. Farewell, farewell, we will never return. We will never return, we've already gone. Beyond the three hills, and we did not find there our beloved sun. We only found the dark night. Beyond three hills, the sun has set. Oh, farewell, farewell, we will never return and flowers will bloom in the early morning. In the early morning, we will never return. The last entry in Matilda's diary is dated February 28th, 1941. There are plenty of blank pages left, so it is not clear why Matilda stopped writing at this point. The Nazis entered Lithuania in June 1941. Matilda could have fled east with her brother Ilya and his wife Lisa, but she chose to go home to her family in Panemonelis instead. A young woman named Maria was working as a midwife in the region and was living with the Olkina's family when they were arrested. Her son retells his mother's memory. My mother worked at the medical clinic in Panemonelis as a midwife. She lived in the Olkina's home. According to my mother, the Olkina's family treated her as a daughter and spoiled her, fed her, took care of her. Then some people, probably local Lithuanian collaborators, showed up at the door and told the Olkina's women they would hide them from the Nazis. Maria said that she thought they said that to trick them into taking their gold with them. The Olkina's women went along quietly. They hugged Maria goodbye and left. Before leaving, Matilda, whom Maria fondly called Marilla, pushed a gold watch into Maria's palm and said that she wanted her to have the watch to remember her by. She said that Matilda had a strong feeling that they would never see each other again. When the Olkina's family and the other Jews of Panamonianus were arrested, friends and neighbors came forward to help bringing them food. Some offered to rescue them by hiding them. They did this at the risk of their own arrest and execution. However, these people were powerless in the face of the war machine of the Nazis and their local collaborators who were helping the Nazis control the local people. 
Father Matelones managed to negotiate with their captors and get the Olkinas family out of the train station where they were being held captive. For a week, he hid them in the wooden rectory beside the church. However, late one night, Noafa's Olkinas went out for a walk and saw a notice stating that anyone caught hiding Jews would be executed. He immediately feared for his friend's life. He weighed the moral responsibility. He turned himself in to the Nazis that same night. The Olkinas family made a moral choice. They knew that those who helped them risked death, and they refused to put other people in danger to save their own lives. In this moral equation, they consciously chose their own death over the deaths of others. On a beautiful hot day in early July 1941, at a bend in the road in the Shedrikishkes village that leads out of Panemoneles towards Kavolishkes, a group of Lithuanians who collaborated with the occupying Nazi forces, known to local people as Baltaraishi, or white armbanders, arrived on bicycles. They left their bicycles in the forest to cross the road from an isolated farmstead that belonged to the farmer, Patra Shakauskas, and began digging a ditch. They did not have much success because tree roots prevented them from digging very deep. So they gave it up and took their shovels to the other side of the road and began digging in the peat bog that belonged to the Kavolishkas Manor. The grass grew lush there, but recently the farmers had harvested the hay, leaving the field flat and empty. They left, only to return shortly afterwards, riding their bicycles alongside a wagon load of people pulled by two horses over the rutted road. An armed guard sat at the front of the wagon and another in the back. More armed men rode alongside the wagon on bicycles. The captives were blindfolded and their heads were bowed. When the wagon reached an incline, the captives were ordered to climb out and walk the rest of the distance. At gunpoint, they were led to the crest of a hill where the field met the dense forest. The guards beat them with clubs as they trudged and stumbled up the hill. Hidden behind a haystack, an eight-year-old girl watched. She was the daughter of the local farmer, Patra Sharkauskas. Their hired laborer, Bronos, ran to find the farmer and tell him what was happening. The farmer came into the yard and climbed up onto the hay rack. The farmer, his little girl, Aldona, and the hired hand could soon no longer see what was happening, but they could hear the screams and the cries which continued for a few hours before the final gunshots came. The Cerulean Bird. Off in the distant skies soared the Cerulean Bird, flying endlessly ecstatic, singing a golden hymn about happiness eternal, joy that cannot be broken, a smile that never ceases. Alongside barns, hillocks, through forests, deserts, with heavy footsteps, the giant made his way, with a bitter glance scanning the landscape, searching for the cerulean bird who flew along the heavens, singing a golden hymn about happiness eternal. Off in the distant skies soared the cerulean bird, and three arrows pierced her, carrying black death within. And they tore open the breast of the cerulean bird, and the heavens were shattered, and not with the ecstatic hymn about happiness eternal, but with the cry of the cerulean bird, her last trembling breath, her bottomless longing. Oh, the quivering bow, why ever did you release that most poison arrow? Who will sing now about happiness exquisite, ecstasy that never ceases, and a hymn that rings eternal?
That day, no one dared approach the killing site. The next day, Mrs. Shatkowskis and the neighbor, Mr. Leitkavichus, walked across the field to take a look. They found a shallow grave. Shatkowskis pushed his rake handle into the earth. The bodies were covered with only a few centimeters of soil. He covered the bodies with more soil and branches, forming a burial mound. No one quite knows the circumstances, but before the Olkinas family was killed, Noach as Olkinas managed to pass his daughter's diary and notebook of poems to his friend, Father Matelonis. The priest hid the diary inside the great altar of the Panemonienis church. Three years later, the Soviets drove the Germans out of Lithuania. In 1950, Father Matelonis was deported to Siberia. The diary and the notebook of poems remained hidden. In the 80s, during the Soviet occupation, Alfredas Andriauskas, a linguist and organist at the Panemonelis Church, recovered Matilda's notebook of poems and brought them for safekeeping to Holocaust survivor Irena Vesaita in Vilnius. Irena recalls, this man dressed as a villager showed up at my door. His hands were work-worn and his clothing was ragged. But I saw in him great intellect and a purity of spirit that was rare in those days. He told me he was the organist at the Panemonelis church. He told me the story of how the priest had saved Matilda's handwritten poetry collection and diary by hiding them inside the altar. When Father Matelonis was arrested by the Soviets and exiled to Siberia, the poems were in danger of being lost. In that moment, I felt Matilda's spirit in a very powerful way. I felt that Matilda's spirit had come back and was asking me to share her poems with the world. Matilda was only a few years older than me. I had survived the Holocaust. She had not. When I first read Matilda's poems, I was crying. I kept thinking, why is she dead and I am alive? I felt guilty. This is a feeling of people who have survived the Holocaust. Everyone is dead, but you are alive. Irena kept the diary and poems safe for 30 years. In autumn 2017, I visited Irena and took photos of the pages of the poems and diary with my phone so that I could translate them. I could only think that if I had died so young, just as I was beginning to find my voice as a poet, I would have wanted someone to find my notebook and to share my poems with the world. It is my wish for my translations to breathe life back into these poems written out long ago with a fountain pen on the brittle yellowed pages of an old school notebook. Poetry speaks to us at our deepest level of humanity. Poetry speaks to our souls. To experience a poem, to live through a poem, one must access the poem through emotion. Matilda absorbed the tumultuous times she lived in through the language of poetry. Matilda was barely 19 years old when she was murdered. She'd only just begun to find her voice as a poet. And yet, being so young, she documented the horror of her times and expressed it through poetry. She perceived the impending danger of the Holocaust and at the same time sensed the fundamental tragedy of humanity that repeats itself age after age. Despite it all, she reveled in the fragile beauty of a provincial life. It was a time of shadow, but it also was a time of light. It was a time of shattering conscience, good and evil playing out on the world stage. The sun expired, the sun died, and you died along with the sun. And now you lie and gaze at the violets and the butterflies among the blooms.